And yet everyone on the planet gets all worked up about these pointless little behaviors, blissfully unaware of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. <laughs> Which obviously doesn't exist. <laughs> Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on them. Well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. I don't see you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> yeah.
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. The fountains also of the deep and of the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And then I looked, and there was water lapping against the shoreline. This band was a ring of muscles. And inside the ring of muscles was a lake. And it's like, wait a minute. I'm already underwater. We went out over the water in this lake and tried to descend in it and bounced off. It was so super saline and dense that the submarine couldn't go down in it. We literally bounced off. And as we bounced off, we sent ripples heading back to the shoreline. 
And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night.
Christoph, why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Okay, uh, we're going to be accessing the weather program now. So hold on to your hats. You got that? No. I think we're going to want to localize the storm over the boat. of manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played, that game being the effort to weaponize space, to control the earth from space and space itself. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, the dirty commies, that whole story. First the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all, was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how 
quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them.
Funny thing with, with people that, you know, they, they consider Noah to be a, a benevolent figure, you know, because he looked after the animals. Oh, Noah, Noah and the animals. is like, are you kidding me? This is a dude that stood by and watched the entire population of the planet perish. He's not benevolent. You know? He's not even, he's not even nice. You know what I mean? At one point in the story, his son says, you know, I thought you were chosen because you were good. And he goes, I was chosen because I can get the job done, mate. <laughs> so I think people are going to be uh, judging from where their questions come from. I think they're going to be quite surprised what Noah actually really means, what it means to be in that. The great flood is coming. We build a vessel to hold the innocent. Snakes are coming too? All the clothes, all the sleep. We are, all of you know it, on the edge of a climatic abyss. unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. ask you, what, what are we? Who are we? Well, we are Americans. We share common hopes, we share common dreams, we share common aspirations. We're going through common struggles. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that everybody here, and I look at this audience and it's representative of the country, everybody here is connected in some fashion. Uh, and our success and our children's success uh, is tied up uh, together. And so, I think most Americans feel that way, but 
What is still true is, is that you know, uh, there's still kind of a reptilian side of our brain, right? A, 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 that, that part of our brain that if somebody looks different or sounds different, that there's a part of us that is cautious. And what we have to do is fight against that. And that's part of what Shirley Sherrod was trying to say in the speech. If you actually read the whole speech, she was acknowledging, I have my own biases based on my experiences, but if I am able to look inward and reflect, then I can get beyond my biases. And that's an exercise that all of us have to undergo day in, day out. And it's a, it's a constant struggle. And, uh, uh, you know, it's something that there, there's nobody in America who doesn't have to at some point think about their own racial attitudes. Can I ask but you if we do, that? then I think there's no reason we can't overcome it. What is still true is, is that you know, uh, there's still kind of a reptilian side of our brain. Right, a, 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 that that part of our brain that if somebody looks different or sounds different, that there's a part of us that is cautious. The world is full of giants. They have always been here, lumbering in the schoolyards limping through the alleys. We had to learn how to deal with them, how to overcome them. We were small, but fast. Remember? We were like a wind appearing out of nowhere. We knew that being clever was more important than being the biggest kid in the neighborhood. As long as we keep our heads down, as long as we work hard, trust what we feel in our guts, our hearts, then we're ready. We wait until they get sleepy, wait until they get so big they can barely move. Then we walk out of the shadows, quietly walk out of the dark, and strike. <laughs> Then we walk out of the shadows. Quietly walk out of the dark.
ago, the United States ambassadors to every country in the world told the leaders of those nations what I am about to tell you. It's a bit complicated, so it will take some time, so I hope you will bear with me, hear what I have to say. A little over a year ago, two American astronomers, Marcus Wolf and Leo Biedemann, working on a mountaintop in Arizona, Shh. Nobody say anything. Nice sky that caused them great concern. Comet. But the comet was, well, there was a remote possibility that the comet was on a path that could bring it into direct contact with the Earth. Now. We get hit all the time by rocks and meteors, some of them the size of cars, some no bigger than your hand. But the comet we discovered is the size of New York City, from the north side of Central Park to the Battery, about seven miles long. Put another way, this comet is larger than Mount Everest. It weighs 500 billion tons. Geologists are going to call it. I want everybody. gets bumped on a lack of billiard ball on a pool table and is knocked into a different orbit. Now, if this comet continues on its path around the sun and keeps its present course, sometime on August 16th, roughly a year from now, there's a chance that we might have impact. So for the past eight months, the United States and Russia have been building the largest spaceship ever constructed. It's being built in orbit around the Earth, and we call it the Messiah. And right now, a team of American astronauts and one Russian are at Cape Canaveral in Florida. In two months, they will leave on the shuttle Atlantis to board the Messiah. This is the crew that will stop the comet. I'd like the world to meet some extraordinary people. First, is Mission Commander Oren Monash. Commander, would you introduce us to your team? I would be honored, sir. Pilot Andrea Baker. Medical Officer Gus Partenza. From Russia, Nuclear Specialist Colonel Mikhail Tuchinsky. Navigator Mark Simon. And Rendezvous Pilot Spurgeon Tanner. Mr. President. Captain Tanner, you flew six shuttle missions. You were the last man to walk on the moon, weren't you, sir? Yes, sir, uh, but Orrin here will be doing most of the flying on this one. I'll just be taking us down to the, uh, you know, the comet surface. Well, it's good to know we're going to have your kind of experience up there, Captain. Thank you, sir. Godspeed to you all. We're counting on you. Thank you, sir. Beijing rocks in Cairo building. Does anyone know how big the one was that killed all the dinosaurs? Does anyone know how big the one was that killed all the dinosaurs? Nothing, nothing majestic, mysterious, and we'll take the entry on the floor of all the comments. Good morning, Good morning. 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 Good you will pay your bills. Isn't it true, sir, that not everyone in your administration is convinced 
That the Messiah will save us? Now, I can promise you this, Miss Lerner. All of you. Everyone in this room and everyone listening to my voice, that at some point over the next ten months, all of us will entertain our worst fears and concerns. But I can also promise you this. Life will go on. <laughs>